I want to start by saying in the opening words of the novel, Anna Karenina, Leo Tolstoy wrote, all happy families are alike, uh, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And it's not necessarily true of people. There are just so many ways that we can be happy as individuals or as families or as a great cancer institute but it's really true of normal cells and cancer cells. Our bodies are made up of trillions and trillions of normal cells. Lungs, skin, brain, bone, muscle, and almost every one of these normal cells has essentially the same genome uh, that's been inherited from our parents with only a, a few changes in our immune cells so that they can adapt uh, to, fight, to fight foreign infections and invaders and cancer. But and even when we go from one person to the next, our genomes are, are very similar. We've got very little variation between us. But the genomes of cancer cells are widely, dramatically variant. They can be almost unrecognizable as, as, as uh, a human genome. They may have, you know, extra copies, parts of the genome destroyed, sequences changed. And, and this uniqueness, these unique genomes are what turn a normal uh, cooperative cell into a deadly cancer cell. The Chinese strategist Sun Tzu said that if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. And to know cancer and to know ourselves, we need to know our genomes. And a cancer's genome is like its secret code. And if we can break that code, then we have a chance to disrupt the cancer's plans and we can defeat it. So as Dr. Glimpser said last night, the um, uniqueness of every cancer genome is at the heart of what we call precision cancer medicine. It's the opportunity to provide the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And it's an opportunity we are beginning to grasp, and it's the heart of the improvements uh, in cancer treatment that we see today that are starting to change the prospects of patients with cancer. So this morning, I'm going to talk about cancer genomes following the four themes that uh, Dr. Glimcher and Josh Beckenstein and Jeffrey Immelt talked about last night technology, collaboration, big data, and innovation. Technology, so George, this was just absolutely the sort of perfect segue. Technology revolutions, right? In 1985, we had the start of computers. It's a big revolution, and just look where they've come. It's, it's just incredible, the revolution that's happened. And it's, it's caps encapsulated in what's called Moore's Law. Gordon Moore was one of the, the founders of Intel. And in the mid-1960s, he said, the power of semiconductors doubles every 18 months. And you can see a little bit of the fruit of that right there. Genomes, though, it's much faster. Genome technology, in some years recently, it's in, it, the power has increased tenfold in every year. I remember when I was a medical student looking for cancer genes, we were looking at the letters of DNA. So the genomes are made of DNA, four letters. A, C, G, and T. Three billion letters from our fathers, three billion letters from our mothers, uh, organized into chromosomes. And, we were and the order of those letters basically is the instructions for what happens in every cell. When I was a medical student 25 years ago, trying to look for cancer genes, we could determine the order of 200 of those letters in a day. Today, with the types of machines that we now have at Dana-Farber, we can look at six billion of those today. A whole human genome. So imagine, you know, this computer would be like a little dot if uh, we had had the same rate of progress in computer technology. It's just incredible. And so, so with this improvement, we're just able to find so much more. And Dana-Farber has been in the center of the genome revolution. And, you know, to, you know, Barry very kindly talked about the impact some of us has had. And it's really the environment at Dana-Farber that's enabled that. And one great thing in genomics is that right across the river from us is the world's great genome sequencing center at the Broad Institute. And we've had an incredible technology collaboration. And that brings me to the next point, which is collaboration. At Dana-Farber, as, as um, you know, Dr. Rollins and Dr. Dimitri both said, it's just an incredible degree of collaboration and communication uh, between basic scientists and clinicians. And when I joined the Dana-Farber faculty in 1998, I committed myself to understanding the secret code, the genome of lung cancers, and started working with colleagues like Drs. Bruce Johnson and Pasi Yane, uh, lung cancer clinicians with Dr. L Neil Lindemann, pathologist who now is the um, medical director of the Profile Program. 
Bill Seller, Dr. Bill Seller is a fellow cancer genome scientist and so many others, and we started to unravel genome alterations. And fairly early on, we found a common targetable alteration in lung cancer in the epidermal growth factor receptor gene, or EGFR. And this started the trend of being able to have targeted therapies um, for so many lung cancer patients, unfortunately still far from all, so we have a long way to go. And when patients started to mutate further and become resistant to these EGFR drugs, then uh, chemist Dr. Nathaniel Gray, structural biologist um, Dr. Mikeak, and uh, lung cancer clinician Dr. Passiani started to work together and uh, started to identify a, a new type of drug, and, um, which has become a newly approved lung cancer drug, osimertinib or trigriso, uh, this past year, one of the, uh, the multiple lung cancer drugs approved for treatment this last year. So technology and collaboration bring us to the third point, uh, big data. And um, both uh, Dr. Dimitri and Dr. Rollins spoke about the profile program. And here, Dana-Farber has really been at the very forefront of bringing big data to bear on patient care. So really, the visionary efforts of Drs. Rollins, Dr. Neil Lindemann, Dr. Laura McConnell, and so many others have established profile where every patient at Dana-Farber has a detailed analysis of their cancer genome. And this has had just remarkable results where we can find the unhappy reason why the cancer grows and we can combat it. An example is a patient of, of Dr. Jeff Shapiro recently, a non-smoking man with lung uh, adenocarcinoma being treated uh, on, on oxygen, uh, supplemental oxygen, really towards the end, um, tested by profile, found a completely previously undiscovered alteration in a gene, the axle gene, never seen before in lung cancer. Dr. Shapiro found a clinical trial of a drug that could inhibit axle. Patient was treated with that drug, had a remarkable response, was able to cycle again. And this is just one example of how, through cancer genomics, we're able to come to understand this sort of secret code of cancer, our enemy, and to combat it. And Big data is not limited to genomic technology, and we heard from Jeffrey Immelt last night about radiology and the big data opportunities, and I think their coming is an opportunity for new and unique collaborations. So every cancer center understands the, the need for technology and collaboration and big data, but Dana-Farber has been really unique in, in Dr. Glimcher's fourth point, which is innovation. And so who makes innovation, and it's really, and, and Dr. Rollins alluded to this, it's the incredible young people who come to our institution, the incredible members of the Oncology Fellowship Program, the students, they're the ones who drive the innovation. And what's the environment that makes innovation possible at Dana-Farber? I think it's the environment of complete scientific freedom, uh, which you don't really find in any institution. I think this is an, uh, a view from the institutional leadership that makes our institute just such a fertile place for, uh, for innovation. Just one example, a few years ago, we developed a new method to find microbes that are associated with cancer, and it just appreciated enormous support from my colleagues. So one of my young colleagues, Dr. Adam Bass, uh, was starting to sequence the genomes of, of colon cancer, and a graduate student in my lab, Alex Koster, said, let's look for microbes in, Alec in, in colon cancer. I said, Alex, that'll never work. The colon is filled with bacteria. We'll never find one that's related to cancer. He said, no, you've got it backwards. That's exactly the point. If we look in the colon, there are all these bacteria, maybe one of them is associated with cancer, and he found one, Fusobacterium, and Alex went on to be named one of Forbes 30 under 30, and recently became a, a, an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School himself, and it's just these kind of young innovators who I think Dana-Farber supports so strongly, who are bringing forward the, the future of cancer care. So technology, collaboration, big data, and innovation, but really to all of these at Dana-Farber, we add one of our most important characteristics, and that's compassion. As scientists as well as physicians, we're driven by one goal. We know the suffering of cancer patients, and we will do everything that we can to build the knowledge, to understand the uniqueness of cancer, to, and to using that uniqueness to find and implement the vision to, de, uh, to defeat cancer. So our thanks to all of you who join us together in this mission, uh, arm in arm together, as we strive to overcome cancer.